Hello, you're watching Talking Europe on France 24. Today we're at the European Parliament in Strasbourg. In our programme, we're going to be meeting two of the politicians who are hoping to become the next president of the European Commission. In this part one of our programme, the man who is currently seen by many people as the most likely to come out on top come next May's European elections. Uh, he is a leading German politician who says he's passionate about Europe, but he has also come under fire in recent weeks over the handling of a row over degradations of rule of law in Hungary. Uh, plenty of topics to discuss with you. Thank you very much for being with us, Manfred Weber. Well, thank you for the invitation. Well, let's start off with uh, your news, of course. You've just been chosen as Spitzenkandidat for your group, the European People's Party. That means the, the person that your group is putting forward uh, for the European Commission president's job. Uh, you say you want to give Europe back to the Europeans. Uh, what does that mean for you? Well, today is Europe seen as an external, as an external power, as a, as a thing where people don't have an influence, where people cannot uh, decide about the future. And that is also what we saw in the Brexit campaign. There was a main message, I want to have my sovereignty back. That was the message of the Brexiteers. And it worked. So that's a proof for me that people don't feel connected. And those who really believe in a good future for this continent must make out of the European Union a democratic European Union. And that is our task. You yourself, you've been the head of your group in the parliament for many years. Uh, you were very easily chosen as Spitzenkandidat for the EPP. Uh, you are still the insider choice, aren't you? Do you think that that will hamper you in the, in the eyes of ordinary Europeans? Uh, may I say that uh, the competition inside of the EPP was not so easy going, I have to okay. tell you, because <laughs> we had this Alex Stupp, a former Prime Minister of Finland, a very strong competitor, and, and we did it in a very fair way to show democratic uh, approach also inside of the party. Now we have chosen, I have some mandate now, and I want to campaign. And to give you a, a little bit an idea about what is ahead of us, I think that Europeans must decide next year in May whether Turkey can join the European Union, yes or no. And I think Turkey cannot become a member of the European Union. So if people vote for my party, they will get finally a commission president who will stop the negotiations towards the Turkey. Open a door, we want to have negotiations and talks with the Turks, but not full membership inside of the European Union. And that is what is needed. So to talk about content, about political initiatives, and people finally decide then about majorities. Well, just on that point then about Turkey, Turkey a very important partner for the EU at the moment uh, with the, the migration deal. Uh, is it not a dangerous move to talk about stopping accession talks with Turkey? No doubt about this. Turkey is an extremely important partner for us. Economically, politically, they are strategically extremely important and all the migration. Mm -hmm. But we learned especially exactly on the migration field, we learned that it's better to have individual deals and treaties to negotiate things and to come to a win-win situation for both sides than to dream about about the enlargement, which will never happen. Let's be frank about this, because there is there are on both sides too much opposition on this. Though my approach is, let's do it sectorial, let's do it case by case, and a strong cooperation with Turkey, but let's stop the debate about the enlargement, because it will not work. Well, uh, looking to the future of the EU, it's a continent that's coming out of a period perhaps of different crises, the financial crisis, the Eurozone crisis, the migration crisis. Uh, now, uh, these things have dominated European politics in the last few years and are widely seen as having contributed to this rise of uh, more extremist uh, political elements. Um, these policies of austerity and the chaotic handling of the migration crisis, do you agree that big mistakes have been made? Absolutely. Europe is too slow. When there is a crisis ahead of us, it didn't, we need too much time to find conclusion on this. On the euro, we discussed for four years. On the migration thing, we are discussing since three years now, since 2015, the issue. And people are upset about uh, too less uh, uh, progress. How would you do things differently? For example, another eurozone crisis, it can't be ruled out entirely. Yeah, therefore, we need very concrete actions. That means a European monetary fund for the European Union, so to be in the future independent from international structures like them in Washington. So there is one thing, is it's content, it's uh, very concrete proposals, and there I would say we need more engagement in finding really compromises. We had too less engagement in the last years, but more important is, you spoke correctly about this crisis thinking, this atmosphere in, in the whole European Union, that we are only dealing with crisis management, and we have to stop this. We have 
have as politicians, we have to say, sorry, together as Europeans, we achieved so lot in the last decades. We are living in a continent of freedom, of peace, and also prosperity. Not yet is everything perfect, but we did a lot. And the key question for us is whether we are united and fight on global level for what we as Europeans believe in, or, or the alternative is we will play no role on global level when we have China, or America, or Russia in mind. And that's why to stick together, to have an idea about what Europe means and to be, be also proud to be an European. Uh, that is my message. There is currently a bit of a clash going on between the European Commission and Italy, uh, the third biggest economy in the Eurozone, over its budget plans. Uh, the situation is still rather fluid as we record this interview. But essentially, Italy's government has put forward plans that are very popular with voters to borrow big and spend big. But the Commission is saying, look, this is not acceptable to us. Uh, just considering the political climate, uh, the amount of Euroscepticism in Italy and elsewhere in the continent, should the Commission perhaps just show a bit more flexibility with Italy. Is this clash really worth it? Well, the Commission showed a lot of flexibility in the last years uh, when it is about the implementation of the rules we agreed on. The rules are not received from heaven. They are decided by the members of the European Union, by the member states of the European Union. They described the conditions for our common currency. And the idea is simply to stick to what you agreed a few years ago. That is what we have to do as well. That's if... why I'm very happy that the Commission was clear, very clear towards Italy. And you must see it's not an Italian problem alone. We are sitting in one boat. If, if Italy is not changing uh, the direction, then Greece and Spain will get a lot of problems on the international financial markets. And the crisis is back. That's why we have to sit together and find compromises. The idea of Europe is always sitting together, mm -hmm. listening to each other and finding compromises. But what if those rules that you refer to that were communally agreed years ago. Uh, what if people are, are changing their minds now? We've seen in the UK uh, over austerity, uh, there's been a, a big rethink by the government. Uh, they're trying to get out of the age of austerity. Uh, in Italy as well, it's a country that's undergone very stringent absolutely. austerity. Perhaps that it's was the wrong decision allowed, at the European level. It's absolutely allowed to change your mind, to have another government, to change the direction politically. But when decisions are made on European level, you need a majority on European level to change things. That's the principle of democracy. And that's why the question is more egoism, nationalism versus, versus cooperation, versus thinking in cooperation. And again, on European level, we are sitting, all of us, we are sitting in one boat. And if we don't understand this, that we cannot unilaterally uh, act, then we are, we are lost. So you're saying Italy's government is acting in an egotistical manner? Absolutely. We even see their nationalistic uh, uh, statements from some of the governmental leaders. So they tell people be proud about Italy and don't care anymore about Europe. Mm -hmm. And that is not what it works, what fits to the today's world. Nationalism is back. We saw this also in the, in the speeches on the commemorations about the First uh, uh, World War. Nationalism is back. And what we have to clarify is, are we still ready as Europeans to be pro-cooperation, pro-compromise, pro-talks to each other? Or are we becoming again egoistic and then we are falling back in history? If you take over as president of the European Commission, of course, you will be overseeing foreign relations for the EU as well. Uh, just last weekend at those armistice commemorations, the US president, we know, put a few noses out of joint in Europe uh, as he visited Paris. Uh, we've got a report uh, prepared. This is from Catherine Viet. An appeal by the French president to world leaders, don't repeat the past. Speaking at the opening of the three-day Paris Peace Forum, Emmanuel Macron warned against the danger of rising nationalism. History will without a doubt remember one picture, that of 84 heads of states and government united. Will it be the shining symbol of a durable peace among nations, or on the contrary, the photograph of a final moment of unity before the world fades into a new disorder. That solely depends on us. A sentiment echoed by the German Chancellor. If isolationism wasn't the right solution more than a hundred years ago, how could it simply be the right choice today in an interconnected world that has five times more people? While dozens heads of state, including Russia's Vladimir Putin and Turkey's Recep Tayyip Erdogan, were on hand, there was one conspicuous absence, Donald Trump. The U.S. president, who's long championed an America first foreign policy, snubbed the event, departing for the states shortly after it began. Designed to be held annually, the goal of the forum is to promote a multilateral approach to fostering world peace and support the work of international organizations 
like the United Nations. So Manfred Weber, uh, Donald Trump uh, upsetting a few people in Europe uh, with his behaviour around those armistice commemorations. Do you see this as a, as a new low in European-American relations? And if so, how to get out of it? Absolutely. And we are not the reason for this because the behaviour of Donald uh, Trump is a reason for the problems which we have on the table. But all these statements, like uh, Donald Trump did in Paris a few days ago, all these statements made it so clear for us that Europe has to become independent. We have to, we have to be so strong that we are without assistance from others uh, capable to defend our interests and to defend the security of our citizens. And that's why all initiatives to come to a common European defence pillar we as a party are asking for a, for a cyber security unit, for example, on European level to defend our European internet or an intervention troop for the European Union. Let's do it now. It's the right moment to do it. I would say always in the format of the NATO, because NATO is a stable base for the Western world, but we have to build up an own capacity on European level. And a European military or a European army wouldn't be against the United States, as Donald Trump seemed to understand? Europe defense pillar means more efficiency because today we are wasting a lot of taxpayers money because every country is doing whatever he wants on the military side if we would combine our forces especially in the internet it's so logical to understand if we have a common unit to defend our cyber security we are much more powerful and much more efficient okay let's talk about another major foreign policy issue or well internal policy for the moment for the EU Brexit yes. uh, as this interview is recorded very intense negotiations are ongoing. You said earlier this year that the timetable on Brexit couldn't be extended. Uh, would you perhaps be prepared to change your mind on that and uh, think that a little extension could be envisageable to avoid a no-deal scenario, which would hurt the European Union? Well, nobody wants to have a no-deal, uh, but it is in the hands of the Brits, first of all, because we offer a lot from the European Union. We offer the Swiss model, we offer the Norway model, the Turkey model, or the Canadian model about Zeta Plus. So there is so much on the table London must decide. And hopefully they are capable to deliver. And what there we can is a learn... great sense, oh, sorry, there is a great sense among the British public, or many members of the British public, that the EU is punishing Britain, is being difficult, is, is trying to put Britain in a weak position. May I be very frank? I don't care at the moment about the British problems because they decided to leave. I am a European politician. I am responsible for France, for Germany, for Austria, for the Europeans. And what people in Europe expect from us is that it must make a difference whether you are a member of the European Union or whether you are leaving the European Union. Those who are leaving are losing the advantages of this union. That is the logic of leaving. Eh? And the Brits are experiencing now during the negotiations what they, what they will lose when they leave the European Union. So that is a lesson they didn't learn before, let me say and that is what they experience now. So that is a tragedy. We all regret this. We fought against this, but it is reality. And again, I have in, in mind the 27, the unity of the EU 27 to be strong, to defend our interests. Okay, let's look to your home country, uh, Germany. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Chancellor Angela Merkel announced she won't be staying on as Chancellor beyond her current term. Uh, she has been under a lot of pressure over poor election results for the CDU and CSU parties. Uh, do you think that she will actually make it to the end of her term? Because there are people predicting she might not be able to hang on. Well, that is not predictable how long the government will be stable in Germany. Angela Merkel decided, first of all, to, to not run again for the party leadership of the strongest party in Germany. That is opening, let me say, a new, a new period in Germany, a domestic politics who will be the next party leader from the CDU in Germany. And she said, I will continue as Chancellor because I have a mandate and elections from the citizens of Germany. I think that is a good middle way. On the one hand, open a new chapter to give a, a perspective for the future, for the next generation. And on the other hand, to keep stability. And I would ask her, frankly speaking, when she is now for the next two or three years in office without the need to be re-elected, that gives you also freedom as a politician in a way to, to do necessary steps for the future. My hope is that together with Emmanuel Macron, very forward-looking uh, president in France, she is now really investing in the future of Europe, that we can present from the German-French axis a future proposal for Europe. Some say, though, she's a lame duck chancellor. No, no. Every, you know, in America, an American president can only run two times. So the second period is a, is a period of freedom. You can do whatever you, not whatever you want, but what you think what is necessary for the future. And again, I think uh, Angela Merkel has so much credibility, so much support among the Europeans. We can count on her. 
Uh, just like to ask a question about one major European issue that we haven't covered, migration. Uh, you and I met about a year ago when the EU was starting to talk about cooperation with Africa over migration. There's just been a report that's come out recently from Amnesty International decrying deplorable conditions for migrants trying to reach Europe but stuck in detention centres in Libya, uh, saying they're exposed to torture, rape, extortion. How much responsibility does the EU actually bear for what's going on in these camps? Well, we define ourselves as a continent who cares about the human dignity. That is a principle for us. Human rights and the human dignity is a main principle behind. And that's why we have to care. We have to show our humanitarian responsibility. That does not mean, let me clarify this, that we allow the smugglers to do their business. So there are two sides of the medal. On the one side, strict border controls. The Europeans want to know who is on European soil. And if, when you have no passport, you cannot cross the external border of the European Union. That is what we have to guarantee. And if we do so, we can say to the Europeans, let's care about real people who need our help, like from Syria, so refugees. And what about, as the UNHCR is asking, uh, relocating people from those camps in Libya, some of them, not all necessarily, into the EU, some of the people who are suffering the worst conditions? Is that something that you would support on a human rights level? The precondition again is border control, because people don't accept any additional migration if we cannot assure that we control our borders. But if we do so, I am ready for the resettlement idea, to have a strict control about who is arriving here under humanitarian criteria. Again, the balance is for me important, to bring things together. Strict border control and readiness to help. Europe is a rich continent, a value-based continent. We have to help. One final question, Manfred Weber, you're hoping to become the president of the European Commission. What for you would be your priorities for your term? The key priority for Europe is uh, keeping Europe together because we have so much splits between East, West, North, South. I, in my political DNA, I'm a bridge builder. I, I like to negotiate, I like to bring things together. And that is what Europe needs uh, under, on the base of strong values to keep Europe together. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Thank you very much for speaking to us here on Talking Europe. Thank you so much. And that's it for part one of our programme. Do stay tuned, part two coming up in just a few minutes' time.